Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Rich Lyons. I'm the dean here at the Haas School of Business. Uh, I appreciate that you're all here. These dean speaker series are a wonderful chance for all of us to convene and hear some of the, the best speakers anywhere. And I'm glad that, that you could be here today. I'm also glad uh, and want to welcome a number of our students from our other MBA programs and a number of our alumni who will be listening in on the presentation part of today uh, via remote and a, a live webcast. Uh, this is, as you know, our highest level speaker series. We bring in a, a group of remarkable pe people. Today is, is no exception. And Ed, for those of you that know him, is, uh, is really a remarkable and very innovative leader, right? This is a, when we think about our own leader concept, the profile of the sort of person that comes to Berkeley, the, the question, the, the status quo mentality, the, many of these other elements are uh, things that have been part of his whole career, and I'll introduce you to a bit of that, but I don't want to take too much time with that. So it is my, um, my great pleasure to introduce you to, uh, to co-founder of Pixar, Ed Catmull. He is, uh, in addition to being co-founder at Pixar, he is also president of Walt Disney and Pixar Animation Studios. Ed was vice president previously of the computer division of Lucasfilm Limited, where he managed development in the areas of computer graphics and video editing, video games, and digital audio. Uh, since the beginning of his career, Ed has been a pioneer in the field of computer animation and has contributed many important developments in the area of computer graphics. After high school, he attended the University of Utah. He received degrees in physics and computer science. After a short stint at Boeing, he came back to the University of Utah to get his doctoral degree. Uh, Ed's focus was on computer graphics then and 3D curves and how to think about curves in three dimensions. He used these technologies to create a short film, quote, uh, a computer animated hand, end quote. Uh, and it, that was a breakthrough to computer animation. It was added, in fact, to the National Film Registry in 2011. Very, very long list of awards and recognitions. Uh, I, I, I'm just a couple, if I may. Uh, five Academy Awards, including a Technical Achievement Award, two Scientific and Engineering Awards, uh, one Academy Award uh, for, of Merit for his work. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, all of us have seen Pixar films. There won't be a person in this room who hasn't seen the likes of Monsters, Inc., or Finding Nemo, or The Incredibles, or Up, or Toy story, uh, any part of that trilogy. Uh, these are things that have left marks on all of us and, and our families. Um, he will share with us highlights from his recent be best-selling book. I've got a copy of it here, Creativity, Inc. It is really a wonderful read. It's got lots of insights, uh, not just into creativity, but also, of course, about managing creativity, which is part of what he will talk about. I'm just going to pull one quote out before I, I set it over to, to Ed. One of, one of my favorite quotes among many in the book, quote, I began to see my role as a leader more clearly. I would devote myself to learning how to build not just a successful company, but a sustainable, creative culture. With no further ado, Ed Catmull. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Dean Lyons. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, good. So it's now been 20 years since Toy Story. Um, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I, my first five years at Utah, second five years at New York Tech, uh, third five years at Lucasfilm, and fourth five years at Pixar, except that five years took 29 years. Um, so when we started Pixar 29 years ago, uh, none of us knew anything. Steve Jobs bought us out of Lucasfilm, but, but Steve knew nothing about this high-end computer that we were making. We didn't have any ma uh, manufacturing people, we didn't have any marketing people, or any sales people. In short, we didn't know what in the world we were doing. Uh, I did have friends in Silicon Valley, um, and I was trying to learn from them. Uh, there was one thing I noticed, though, and that was there was this, uh, um, I don't know what the right term for it, it's like, it's, uh, 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 like, 
first order conclusions. In other words, if you succeeded, then what you were doing was right, and if you failed, what you did was wrong. Um, and I was a little skeptical of those, and, and it wasn't necessarily they always uh, thought that way, but the press and the way things are written up tends to exacerbate that, that concept. Um, but over the years, I had my own theories about how to do things, and I've also found over the years about one-third of my theories are flat-out wrong or irrelevant. And which third is wrong and irrelevant changes over time. Uh, by, by the way, sometimes they're right at one time, and then I realize that they were wrong looking back. And I can't go over um, all those issues in this short period of time. Um, but instead, what I'd like to do is focus on a particular story, which is the, uh, the turnaround at Disney Animation. In 2006, Disney acquired Pixar, and they put John Lasseter and me in charge of both Pixar and Disney Animation. Um, so let me give a little brief overview of, of Disney. I know you kind of know this, but I'll give it from my perspective. So when Walt Disney started Disney Animation, he used the high technology at that time. Although today people don't refer to it that way because it's like it's old fashioned. But in fact, it was the high tech of the time. The first in animation in terms of using sound and color, uh, matting, we, we now call it green screen or blue screen, but then it was sodium mats. Uh, they used the Xerox room. Whenever it was available, he used it. Um, when uh, Walt, Walt moved on and then he died, it was the end of an era. And they lost their energy and no one knew why. It just frizzled away. Then in the early 1980s, his nephew, Roy Disney, was part of a hostile takeover which brought in new management into Disney. And it was Roy who drove this process of entering into a contract with Pixar to write some software for them. And the analysis at that time said that if they used that software in production, that it would make no, it would give them no economic advantage. But Roy pushed ahead believing that the technology was necessary to help uh, change the dynamic of what took place in the creative process. And so he understood that in terms of his uncle's mindset. So this launched a second golden age at Disney. Now at this point, because we had this contract with them, we could watch from the sidelines. And during this period of time, they made Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and Lion King. And these were four culturally, or worldwide culturally significant films. They had dramatic and rapid success. And they stated at the time that animation was the new Broadway. The musical became the model. And financially, it was very successful. What was not as obvious was that it became quickly artistically bankrupt because they kept repeating the same model over and over again. And after those four films, they went into decline. Now, when they were making those films, they had this term which was feed the beast. It's also a term that's frequently used in television or in print. That is, you have got uh, a large part of your people involved in having to keep something going. Um, it's a, it, it makes sense. It's a lot where your, your creative energy is. It's where your costs are. So they need something to keep on going. When the leadership moves on, then usually the people who are running the beasts, in our case the production people, are the most organized people in the building. And the tendency is to take the most organized people and put them in charge. What normally happens though, and what happened here, was putting those people in charge meant they brought with them their values. And their values were about making things run smoothly. Um, and again, at this time, the energy was lost. And they didn't know why. So by the time we had arrived in Disney, it had been, year, been years since they'd had a success. And we arrived, and well, I knew two or three people there, and John knew a few more. We knew almost nobody there. They were dispirited, and they were lost. We were welcome because they wanted to be succeed. They wanted to succeed, but they just didn't know what to do. 
All we knew was that their processes and their concepts were wrong. And we didn't know if the people weren't any good or if it's just that they weren't well trained. Just didn't know. Now this was a unique opportunity for us. Uh, most people at Disney felt that we should not run both studios. That we should actually shut Disney Animation down and just run Pixar. Pixar was a success. Disney Animation was not. And this is a legitimate concern. We certainly know there's an issue of people being spread too thin because they try to take on too much. However, we took it on for three reasons. One is, is because of our, the impact on us as kids. We felt like there was an, uh, an obligation to try to resuscitate this great institution. The second one, which is one of my motivations, was I had all these theories. And this was now an opportunity to test them in a different environment. Now, how often, do you, how often do you even get a chance like this? Like, you run two businesses that are basically in the, the same businesses, but one group is highly functional and the other one is highly dysfunctional. And now you can test the ideas against each other and try to separate out what your ideas are from, in fact, hidden contributions from people that you're not acknowledging. Uh, the third reason for doing this, this was I know that basically all businesses are unstable and that we would have problems at future, in the future at Pixar. So that if we, if we tried to turn Disney around, we would learn something and what we learned could then be brought back up to Pixar. Um, now we made a decision early on to keep these two stu studios separate. That is, they were not allowed under any conditions to, to do any production work for each other. Ideas could flow back and forth, but we couldn't do any work for each other. Um, now, um, initially, this was like a one-way street because the ideas were flowing from Pixar down to Disney. Uh, and I want to go over a couple of those ideas where, um, just to, to give you a flavor. One of them has to do with the brain trust. Uh, now, the term brain trust is not an original term. People have been using it for years. Um, and we have one at Pixar, which is very unique, and, and a lot of people write about it, but it's not very well understood. Uh, and, and it has quite a reputation for what it does. And one of the consequences of the reputation is that a lot of the other studios, they call their group of filmmakers the brain trust. Now, the only thing they have done is to change the name. But other than that, there's no change in behavior. So when I talk about a brain trust, what I'm talking about is, an, is a group that is behaving in a certain way. And it's not even a well-defined group. It's going to change from, from time to time. Um, most would assume that it's just you're putting your smart and your best people in the room and, and, uh, and say they're the brain trust. Um, what we found was that we were very lucky in the first five people in this were extraordinarily good. And we didn't appreciate how lucky we were that they had those characteristics. But they worked so well that we thought we would try to apply the concept into other areas, like in our technical areas. Now, in our technical areas, the leaders all liked each other. They respected each other. They were friendly with each other. We got together and put together this brain trust. It didn't work. So then we had to go down and say, what was the difference between the one that works and the one that didn't? And the first thing we came up with was the realization that in the brain trust that worked, that is the directors, we gave them no authority. They had no power. Basically, we had removed the authority from the room. Steve Jobs was not allowed to attend these meetings. Right. Now, he understood that if he were in the room, he would alter the dynamics. The dynamics had to be that the director of the film is going to be the final word on the, on the movie. And the other people in the room, even as John Lasser, can't override the director. And what this does is it makes it safe for the director to listen to the others. Right, that's the key concept, is you have to make it safe for them to listen. When you are presenting a new idea or something that you've been working on hard, you lose objectivity on it. You're actually exposing yourself. You're emotionally very exposed when you do that. 
it's imperative that you go to great lengths to, to make it safe for them to hear the criticisms that are never going, inevitably going to come up because they haven't lost objectivity the way that you have on your own project. Um, our brain trust meetings go anywhere from two hours to sometimes being two days. And overall they work as evidenced by the quality of the films. But every once in a while they're a disaster. They just don't work at all. And there are all sorts of things that get in the way. There's ego that get in the way. People want to show how good they are. Um, they don't want to embarrass each other. And here's another one which is a little subtler is once they get to know each other they learn how to ignore each other's notes. All right? it's a, it takes a while to learn it, but it's a skill you can learn. Um, and then there are some who subconsciously will defer to what they assume the power structure to be. That is, if there's somebody experienced in the room, they won't say anything. It's sort of like if you were to go to a meeting with Steven Spielberg and he were to ask you for your comments on the film, well, there's a limit to what you're going to say because it's a respected filmmaker in the room. And, and that, that works in, in all kinds of groups. Now, as I say, sometimes it was a disaster. Usually it works. Every once in a while, magic would happen. And I would say with most of those films, there was one, at most two, but, but one time in which magic happened. So one of these happened on Tangled, where it's a disaster. And all of a sudden, you go to a two-day offsite, and things click into place. One of my favorite ones was actually on Frozen. Frozen was a disaster. It wasn't working at all. Who the queen was, the sister, the relationship, um, just everything about it was a complete mess. And then we had one of those offsites, and it was pretty phenomenal, because what happened was that you could tell that everybody in the room was focused on the problem. And you could see the loss of ego. Now, a lot of ideas were flowing around. A lot of them didn't work, and a lot of them did, uh, a lot of them did work. But it was that loss of their ego as the group actually worked together in the swirl of ideas. And you saw the whole thing transform. And it, we don't record these. So we're watching these, and they're magical. And I can't even describe them. I mean, it was, first of all, it was a two-day-long experience. Um, other than to say that this is the goal. And if you can get to that point, then phenomenal things happen. Um, in any case, though, with all those, whether they're bad or good, our job as managers is to watch the room dynamics. And there are a lot of unspoken things that go on. The things that go on to this day where there are assumptions that are made, and we don't know what the assumptions are because people don't talk about them. For instance, we discovered one recently at Pixar where the, the group of story people who were sort of sitting around the edges, they never said anything. And it wasn't until some meetings recently uh, I realized that they all believed they had been told not to talk. And so they hadn't. But because they believed that, they never said anything about it. So it took a long time in probing to, to discover that this was the reason they weren't talking. I mean, it didn't even occur to us that they would have been told this, that's so why we didn't ask them in the first place. And once we gave them permission to talk, then the nature of the room changed. But I'll be damned if it didn't take a while to figure this out. And that's just kind of the nature of the way it is. And our job is to try to figure out what these things are, no matter how hidden they are. These groups also change over time as the people have success and as they have more experience. Down at Disney, while we started off explaining the principle of the brain trust to them, it took two years for them to become good. And then it took another two years for them to become great. Now, after the two years when they became good, I knew they were missing something that we had at Pixar they didn't have. And I did not know how to replace that. When they became great two years later, I didn't know why. I could look around the room and say, okay, this room is great. They have a different personality. I don't know what the missing element was. And I'll come back to that. The second big area we had to change down at Disney had to do with the way they thought about mistakes and errors. And the first example was 
the first film they made under our tenure, which was a film called Bolt. And uh, the funniest character in this movie was a hamster named Rhino. And it turns out the, the, uh, the controls, the animation controls, were so complex that the animators could not get him done in time. Um, they, uh, they had eight months left on the schedule, and he was just impossible to animate, and, but he was critical of the film. So they asked for him to be re-rigged and remodeled. Now the modeling, of course, is the, the building of the character. The rigging are all the controls. So there are thousands of controls um, in this character. And so they went back to the technical department and they asked them to re-rig him. And they said, we will do it, but it will take six months. And we have eight months left on the film. So basically we're screwed. <laughs> so, and, and we got this rule, which we adhered to was, no, neither studio could go in and solve each other's problems. So I called the company together for a meeting. Um, and it was an hour to try to explain the, uh, the, the principles about how to think about things. I couldn't give them any technical solutions at all. First of all, I had a different pipeline than, than Pixar. I didn't even know how their pipeline worked. But the basic uh, principle was this notion, it's a phrase you've all heard, that it is better to ask forgiveness than permission. It's a phrase you've all heard. But now think about what it really means. It means that somebody is so convinced this is the right way to do things, that they're willing to go against their manager, against their bureaucracy, and against what they think are the boneheaded rules, putting themselves at risk to do the right thing. That's what it means. All right? That's pretty cool. Now, the opposite of that, the, the top-down view, that's the very bottom-up view, the top-down view is that, is that it's better to fix problems than to attempt to try to prevent them all. And they had actually gone down the wrong path here. So that weekend, two uh, of the programmers went home and re-rigged and remodeled the character. And they were done in four days. And within a week, it was in production. OK. So what's the difference between uh, one week and six months? All right. It was all of those mechanisms put in place to prevent mistakes and to prevent errors. All right. They were all things put in place to protect the organization. And those things put in place to protect the organization were, in fact, screwing things up. It's an extreme example, but actually it's typical. Our job is not to prevent errors. It's to respond when things go wrong. And this is where the creativity arises. I think this happens at all places in an organization. It also means we have to be OK when things don't work. If those two people had failed, it had to be OK. Like, um, first of all, I wouldn't even known, and they, nobody they would have said anything. It would have been OK. And it has to be OK to let people try something. You find out about it, and well, it's good for them. At least they tried. The permission to make it safe to fail, though, has to come from the top. Unless the top allows it, they won't do it. OK, now, what was interesting about this particular example was that we had talked to them about failure and mistakes before any of this ever took place. So explaining it to them didn't make a difference. They had gone down this trap until we actually got them to change their behavior. But it shows part of the depth of the, of the problems regarding um, and misunderstandings about failure and mistakes. Now, it's fairly popular to talk about um, uh, failure recently. Uh, you, you need to fail to succeed, fail early, fail fast. I mean, there are books written on it. And, um, and, and you know, we recognize the value in it. But we actually, we actually have a very deep problem here. And that is there are two fundamentally different meanings to the word failure. One of them is that you try something, it doesn't work, and you learn. And that failure is a powerful learning tool. 
at an intellectual and an academic level, you know this is true and you had experiences in your life where those failures help propel you forward. And you get that. The other meaning is the one you got in school, in elementary school, where you fail a test, you fail a class, you fail a job, means you're not smart enough or you screwed up. Uh, projects fail, companies fail, relationships fail, bridges fail, markets crash, governments fail. They're all bad. Uh, and it isn't just a problem of our schooling years. In politics and in business, failures are used as bludgeons to attack opponents. There is an aura of real danger around failure. And so we have both of those meanings operating simultaneously inside each one of us. And, the, and therefore we end up with kind of a feeling of that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. As if it's a necessary evil. And one has to get to the deep understanding that it's not a necessary evil. It in fact is a necessary consequence of trying something new. However, people want clarity. And there are certain industries where, there are certain parts of it where uh, the issue of mistakes and failures are very clear. So if you think about banking, you don't want mistakes in your banking. If you think about the aircraft industry, where zero errors is very meaningful to the manufacturers, to the airline companies, and to you. Right? So it's a very clear concept. And the ease of defining the extremes is what draws us towards them. But let me take the other side of this, which is the, the mistake side or the you know, dumb idea side. Imagine that you were to go into a meeting, and it was a fairly important meeting because you were discussing a difficult problem. And so you start off by, you start off the meeting by saying, what we're discussing today is so important to the company that I don't want anybody in this meeting to say anything dumb. Now, you know that would be a bad way to start a meeting. All right, so zero dumb ideas is actually a bad idea. All right, and you get that. I mean, everybody can understand that. Just telling a group that we won't allow any errors or mistakes in this meeting would be a bad idea. How about 40 dumb ideas? Is 40 dumb ideas okay? Probably not. If somebody is using a lot of time spewing up stuff and not solving problems, that's not good. Or they may not belong in the room or have the abilities. So where between zero, which is not good, and 40, which is not good, should you be? I don't know. I just know that the two extremes are not where you want to be. You want to be someplace which is very hard to define in the middle. Um, there were several other steps in the turnaround of Disney, and I don't have enough time to go over them. Um, but I want to emphasize two important points. One of them was, when he first got there, we explained all of the principles in about four hours. Not all at once. <laughs> but as we explained them, everybody nodded their heads in agreement. And while the idea sounded good, it was alien to their culture. It took four years for, the, for them to actually understand it. There's a vast difference between thinking you understand something or nodding your head in agreement and actually understanding it. But the second important point, this is a critical one, is that when they succeeded, it was largely the same people who were there when they were failing. All we had to do was to remove the impediments. And when we got rid of the barriers and the impediments and all the things that got in the way, they became creative and they solved their own problems and they owned those solutions. They couldn't have gotten that from a four-hour talk from me. First of all, if, I'd have, if I would have said that, even if they agreed, they didn't own it. It's me talking to them. But in learning it themselves, 
they then fully owned it and they knew that they had solved the problems themselves. And it changed their mindset and how they felt about themselves. So the talent was there. It was just a matter of getting rid of the blocks. And if there's any one organizing principle at Disney and at Pixar, it is that there are subtle and difficult forces that work all the time that we can't see. And our job is to look for them, recognize them. There's always some more that we can't see. Now, at the beginning, I said what I would hope would be there's some lessons that would come back to Pixar from Disney. Uh, and there were. Now, one thing that some of you may know is normally when a large company acquires a, a small company, um, one of the things they do is they try to remove duplication. You know, there's a consolidation for economic reasons. Um, we did the opposite. Um, we instead tried to uh, keep the things that are in duplicate in duplicate. Um, and there were philosophical reasons why we decided to do that at, the, at that time, uh, but they proved to be the right thing for us. However, we did say to people, and I'll use our, our production pipeline, that is the technical pipeline as an example. We said to them, you can beg, borrow, and steal any of the ideas from the other animation studio, but you don't have to. The decisions about how you run your pipeline are entirely up to you, and what you do, what you put your research dollars on are entirely up to you. I won't tell you what it is. Even I won't tell you. Like, don't even ask me. Just do what you think is right. And they did, and still do. They have different pipelines, different R&D groups. However, we recently put together this organization, we call it DISGRAPH, uh, modeled after SIGGRAPH which, on the technical side, and then it's Disney. But we brought together the research groups and the technical groups from, from five different places in the Disney organization. So there was uh, Pixar, Disney, uh, ILM, and uh, we have uh, uh, research at uh, Imagineering, and then we have two uh, uh, research um, groups at uh, universities, Zurich and, and Carnegie Mellon. And again, the principles explain, you can uh, take whatever you want from the other people here, the choices are always yours. The result was, in, that, in their presentations, there was no threat. There's nothing existential. Nobody was saying you're going to consolidate the best or you have to take the best practices. There's no arguing about best practices. It's just now a matter of, of you, you can listen and take it if you want. And the results were phenomenal. They're friendly, they share, um, they take what they want, and they call each other and they form this larger communal organization. Um, now, now the reality is this industry is changing so fast, both in terms of the hardware and the software and the expectations and the skill set of people using it, that for us to think that there's a single pipeline that we should, that we should use is folly. It's a false economy to say that we're going to try to uh, aggregate into a single pipeline. But the result now is we've got a stronger group across the company and there isn't anything else like it that exists in the industry. Um, then on the story trust, let me, let me re return to this thing where I, I said that after four years they became great and I didn't know why. And I discovered it accidentally. And it was while I was at Pixar. Uh, Jim Morris and I uh, were meeting individually with all of the departments in the company. And, uh, and while we were in the sort of middle of, this, of, of doing this, and it takes place over a couple of weeks because of the number of departments, I was in our lobby and one of the writers came up to me. Now, the writers are hired from the outside, and they come and work on a film. They're not, they're not uh, employees of the company. None of them are. But one of the writers came up to me and said, you, you're meeting with all the different departments. Why aren't you meeting with the writers? So the first thing that, hit, that came to my head was, well, you're not one of our employees. That's why we're not meeting with you. <laughs> the second thought, I had was, he thinks he's one of us. Cool. <laughs> so the first thing I said was, you're absolutely right. Our oversight. We'll set up a meeting right away. So then I, I realized, oh, the thing that was missing 
down at Disney was made up for by the fact that all of the writers attended all of the brain trust meetings and they provided that component of thinking about story structure which, which uh, was necessary, which we had up at Pixar and they didn't initially have down at Disney. And then I realized, you know, at Pixar we only have the writer for the film come and then the other writers come. So we changed that. We invited all the writers to come to everything at Pixar and they like doing it because they like taking a break from what they're doing. They also like the challenge. So suddenly the group became stronger because we had added now a strong group of voices to the film who also understood the process. So Pixar was made better because of this. But another thing that happened was that um, as we were struggling with the film at Pixar, uh, we we're kind of caught in it. And part of the reason it gets caught is everybody knows it and then if you don't see something you just miss it. So we decided to show it to the brain trust down at Disney. Now as I mentioned initially it was a one-way street and then we stopped doing that because the people at Pixar said we can't keep spending so much time on Disney issues. We love them but we just don't have enough time. So basically we stopped doing it for a while. But once they reached that level of being very high, then we took the, the Pixar film down there and they poked at it and they, they're poking at it, they came up with some ideas which turned out to be breakthrough for the film. And the director of Pixar recognized the value and we thought, well that was sort of unexpected. So then we took a Disney film which was stuck and we brought up the Pixar Brain Trust and they completely turned it over and, and, uh, and have made this, or caused this massive improvement in it. And we realized that we now have two groups that speak the same language, they know what it means to give notes to each, each other at, at that phase of time, they respect each other, and they are fresh eyes. And we can probably only do this once per film, but we now have an asset we didn't have before. So, I mean, this is awesome. Now, each company is better for this. So, now what we've got is two companies that are healthy, but they have very different personalities, and they're also in different phases. So, we're taking ideas from one, sharing them with the other, and, and helping the others grow. Now, I haven't said much about Pixar on this whole process. Many have assumed that Pixar has got it figured out. Well, if there's one thing we know for making 14 successful films, is that there are always, always big problems. Another uh, result of having all these successful films is that it leads to higher expectations, the pressures become enormous, uh, and the production, the creative leadership all start to peg things at higher levels. And again, going back to this notion of that first order conclusion, if, we are su if you're successful, you must be doing stuff that's right. Well, what it's doing is hiding problems, and so what we're finding is there are new problems surfacing because of the success, because of the assumptions, which causes the groups to become more conservative. And it's a very fascinating process uh, to watch. Um, and I love watching uh, what happens as we go through change and uncertainty. That we don't actually know uh, what happened in the past just as we don't know what happened in the future. And it's a subtle thing because most of us look at the past and think we can understand it because like we say that, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, which is bullshit, right? You have almost no idea of what the results were that got, or the things that took place to get you where you are. Just like you don't really know exactly what's going to happen in the future. And the problems that we face are not the impediments to the job, they are the job. So with that, let me open it up for questions.